available on YouTube right now but the purpose actually is to make the video available so when I finish the, the lecture the video will be available right away in YouTube so streaming is started so this is I am in YouTube now on all the videos they will be available there is a bit lag but it's fine other than that everything is fine uh, my plan initially was to like stand in front of this whiteboard I have a whiteboard in my office and uh, let me show you my office sometime else because we need I'm back so today we'll cover back what we have covered last time but in more details I believe many of you are available one of your colleagues and mother died today she's a lady forgot her name but send her your condolences uh, I will uh, remind you later on she couldn't come today she said uh, you probably will see that I'm also recording your names the time you come in and the time you leave so let me bring this thing It's an addition to Google Chrome so you know when people uh, join the meeting and when they left. Maybe since I left myself, those are grayed out. Our class, but I'm seeing they are available. Anyway, I don't, I don't record like your attendance, but I recommend that you attend all the time. You don't classes. I will not record the attendance uh, uh, until the things settle down perfectly. Let's go back to the lecture. I'm streaming from a second monitor. Is again an introduction to geophysics. We'll have a break five minutes. Within that break, you can get a coffee or tea and come back or ask any questions to me. The break will have it by uh, 3.15. So the lecture is about geophysics. Geophysics is an important course in our curriculum. It's the first course, general geophysics taught to many students, not the geophysicists, but to geologists. Uh, it's a mandatory course supposed to be taken by geologists and as well as petroleum engineers. Usually you'll find that there are students from, um, from other departments in geology. Uh, excuse me, doctor. Yes. Uh, the resolution is not that much high, so if you can increase it, that will be appreciated. I uh, will do that right now. Let me check. Uh, also, the voice, doctor, your voice. My voice is not clear? It's quite a bit. Uh, just let me go do something. I'm changing the mic. Sorry about that. I will change the mic. Let me turn off this one. You
change the settings. دكتور ما في صوت نوسا دكتور Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Could someone confirm that either he or she can hear me or not? Right? Guys, hello. Yes, uh, doctor, we can hear you, but it is very low. Is it still low? Very, yes, very low. I think, I think you can increase the sensitivity of the mic from the settings. And this, that will solve the problem. Let me try. I can you hear you clearly. the best I can do. How is it right now? Is it better? Little, little bit, yeah. Little bit. It's a little bit better, yeah. No, doctor, we can't hear you. Your voice can. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. It's clear, clear now. Doctor. Yes, yes. Now we can hear you very clearly. Okay. Yes, doctor. Okay. Probably those mics they will not work. I'm removing this one. So I'm uh, I'm using the built-in mic which comes along with the camera. Uh, it does not remove the noise, but since it's working fine, that's good. Uh, is it clear to everyone? Can you listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much. So let's start again. Uh, doctor, the sound is clear, but uh, the resolution? Uh, the resolution, this is the maximum I can reach. Sorry about that. For some reason, I cannot increase it. So this is 720. My camera can go up to uh, 1080. But this is the maximum resolution possible using Google Meet. I, I can't do anything. Maybe if you watch me on uh, YouTube, you find the resolution is better. If you watch me on YouTube, a streaming live stream, you'll find that the, the resolution is way better there. So in case you're interested on the, on the resolution itself, you can watch me from uh, YouTube. And if you have two, uh, two like uh, could, um, 
uh, your phone and your laptop close to, to you right now. You can talk from, if you have a question, you can talk from, uh, from your phone. At the same time, you open your laptop and watch me from there, but from YouTube. My channel name, uh, let me send you the link. This is... This is the link to this live streaming in YouTube right now. The quality I believe is better there. If someone is watching me from YouTube, can you confirm at least? So we don't need to spend much time on the setup itself and go forward. Victor? Yes. I was sent to you the the method how to do this thing in it was in the email okay i will check back then sorry i got uh, busy okay. last week okay thank um, you maybe you can you send it again i haven't noticed okay. that okay can, can now you, not now anytime later on okay okay no problem thank you for this. so let's go a bit back to our lecture um so geophysics is an important course in the curriculum uh, supposed to be taught by someone who is uh, who can deliver the message correctly and make it easy to everyone because uh, it's not taken by geophysics students taken by geologists and the background and uh, the concept and understanding of everyone is different you know there are students from their second year the same time you find in the same course students from their fourth or fifth year so uh, you need to make a balance in here and deliver the message correctly without complicating and uh, bring all the students to the same foundation or to the same basis so you they understand what you are talking about so geophysics itself uh, what is it and when i joined the program i was a student in here in sultan Qaboos university in like uh, late uh, I joined 2004, so I graduated in like, I believe 2009. Spent five years doing my BC in, in Sultan Qaboos University. I never know what is geophysics exactly is. And I suddenly joined uh, this program from a friend who recommended it to me. Uh, we were talking, we were taking a course together. She said, oh, why don't you join the geophysics program? It's an interesting program. It's quite has some application similar to uh, the students in the College of Engineering and it combines geology with physics. So I interested on the topic. Uh, I, my, this was my first choice. The second choice was chemistry. I was accepted happily to the program and um, yeah, it was very interesting. It is difficult a bit. The difficulty comes from the point that the students need to understand many concepts. For example, geologists usually they care about the observations. Their point is direct, and they, they the measurements they make their direct measurements usually. In comparison to geophysics, uh, the geophysicists they need to combine many disciplines together. Probably they need to know a bit of um, math and uh, and physics as well, and take some courses from computer engineering. Right now, there are students complaining why they are taking uh, the course named uh, uh, Python 2. Python 2, and uh, my to myself, I think it's a very important course. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, having a knowledge in computer science is, I believe, it's a must. But you know, that's how the program goes. So the students need to expand their knowledge into many disciplines. So, geophysics. By the name itself, geo is geology. Physics is the physics uh, things related to geology. So it's a method, it's an application of the methods of physics to the geology, to the study of earth science. You might know that the rocks are made of a different composition. What is controlling the rock type? It's physical shape, it's physical properties too, chemical composition, and biological processes controlling these rocks. So the physical properties of rock can be analyzed by geophysicists to give an understanding to the geologist uh, what rock type is that. 
and how we know the rock without touching it because geologists they go to uh, outgroups and check what is the rock type using either like H2, H2L or one other, other like uh, reactive materials to the rocks and understand the rock type. Geologists, geophysicists, sorry, they know the rock type indirectly. Let me do something in here so you... You know what I'm doing exactly. So when if I talk, my my voice gonna be written. Whatever I say, they're gonna be written in here. Uh, it might take some time to start uh, the writing part, but it works usually very good. This is a plus with the PowerPoint, Go uh, Microsoft PowerPoints. So as I said, um, we study the the geology indirectly using physical techniques so probably there are some iron deposits so you know those iron deposits they can deflect the compass the compass is supposed to be pointing to the north orientation but because irons are magnetized usually they can deflect the orientation of the compass so understanding why this happens, why the, uh, the, uh, the compass is get deflected is very important. And the geophysicists, they, they can tell you uh, either the rock beneath us are magnetized or not. Another thing, you know, the rock, the, another physical property with the rock is their density. We can make use of this property to understand what, ta what type of rock beneath us. There are rocks which are very dense, like igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, they are denser than um, uh, sedimentary rocks. And you probably know the reason behind that. We will not go to the geology, but we use the use geophysical techniques, some geophysical techniques which can detect those variation in the rock density to tell us what is the rock type. Another property with the rocks, or exactly physical property, is the velocity of sound or velocity of disturbance or exactly seismic velocities. Are the slides okay? Yes, uh, the slides, your voice, everything is okay with me. Okay. Uh, because in here I'm seeing them the, in the opposite direction. <laughs> anyway. So those velocity variation in velocity, they can be analyzed by geophysicists to learn the rock types. For example, again, uh, the same property with the density, because density and velocity, they are quite correlated. The rock which have high density usually associated also with high velocity too. So there are physic geophysical techniques which can tell you how fast the seismic, the velocity we talk about is seismic velocities. What is seismic? We'll learn later on in this course what exactly is seismic techniques in geophysics and how it can be used. The seismic technique is actually the technique which is used quite often in oil industry to explore for hydrocarbons. So you might say can we just rely on geophysics and keep the geology part aside? That's not possible. So it's something that adding another sense to you. You can test something, but you cannot see it. You can hear something, but um, you cannot see it too. Why not combining all these senses together? So it's an additional sense which can be brought to geologists. Which, which can aid them to understand more about the subsurface rock types. So geophysics, as I said, it adds another dimension. That dimension is the depth. 
because you cannot drill everywhere to understand the rock types to get samples of rock or cuttings of the rock drilling is really expensive procedure instead use geophysical techniques which are way way less expensive and cheaper and use them to understand the rock types beneath us what are the different types of geophysical techniques or the aspects of geophysics there is a pure geophysics the, in the pure geophysics we are interested in the physical principles of geophysics so one of the principles of uh, uh, geophysics and how we relate geophysics to, ge uh, to geology is like the magnetic fields of the earth or the gravitational field of the earth how they are originated and what's the controlling factors in these so in this case, we call that geophysics pure geophysics. Whenever they try to create mathematical equations or theories to, the, to the, some phenomena we see on the top surface of the Earth, like the gravitational force or the magnetic fields of the Earth. The other aspect is exploration geophysics. In the exploration geophysics, we need to know something about pure geophysics. We need already to know that there is um, a gravitational force and this is the equations controlling the gravitational force of the earth and also the magnetic field of the earth we need to know them we need to understand them to use the exploration geophysics exploration geophysics is usually is usually the application of these techniques to the exploration of different resources of the earth like the oil and gas minerals etc and finally is like the earth itself can act as a big laboratory um, probably you have heard of earthquakes so earthquakes are events seismic events to be exact they they are very destructive destructive but they have some usefulness too so through those earthquakes i can understand what is the internal structure of the earth what the earth is made up of with so uh, we know that the earth is layered it made of many major layers or units the crust the mantle the inner and the outer core you might ask did they made a drill to the core of the earth to know what exactly the composition of the earth no they never made that drilling it's uh, impossible almost to make such drillings but they use geophysical techniques so they use geophysical techniques to understand the internal structure of the Earth. There was an image in here. So I forgot about this image. So what exactly the geologists do usually whenever they find some outgroup like this? They go visit the site, examine the rocks, and they find that there are four rock types, first, second, third, and the fourth. And they go to the opposite side of this uh, wadi or plane they find the same rock types with the same compositions what assumptions they can make in this case they can make an assumption that these two rocks are the same rocks and the rest of these outgroups are beneath the surface how they what is their shape exactly that's really quite impossible to know for geologists without drilling there might be, for example, a fault cutting through them. There might be an intrusion. There might be salt, a salt therapy. Do you see my mouse? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's Yes, good. we can. So this is actually a salt therapy. So it was um, um, an ancient sea somewhere and dried up. When the, the sea dried up, the salt remained and the soil they can move whenever they are compacted so this you see what what kind of shape they formed it's called soil too and they are very complex structures there is a fault associated with the, the salt and some layering so without geophysical techniques it's almost impossible to know the internal structure of the earth your basic guess is that these are the same rocks and the rest of them is beneath our surface. How they look like beneath our surface? 
using this geophysical geological technique is really impossible unless you make a drill so you say okay why not drilling then there is a big comparison uh, then uh, you don't might not have that much budget to make a drilling it's better than to use geophysical techniques lower your budget don't harm the ground don't make a lot of drills because drilling is a one uh, one of the problem it's very expensive and might harm also the environment and you cannot even if you drill a lot still there is some like guessing need to be done even within two wheels probably there is another fault you might not know but geophysics can bring this third dimension so the first image you see there it's uh, the earth magnetic fields and the other image the next image is how the oil exploration is done I'm seeing a vibrator and I'm seeing a recording truck and there are some instruments slide out on the surface of the earth they are listening to the sounds or seismic waves which goes down to the earth and reflected back this is an exploration geophysics in here I'm trying my principle or my objective is to know where exactly the hydrocarbon is located and then when I find that the amount of hydrocarbon is commercial to produce I start drilling the last image these are the phases of seismic waves when they go uh, beneath the subsurface in travels uh, between those layers big layers and get reflected or refracted they come up with different phases and the, uh, the, uh, the seismologists they gave us give us these names you don't need to care about the names we are not doing seismology we will not go cover all of these uh, namings so it's not very important for you right now as a geologist or petroleum engineers to remember all of these conversions or reflections and to what are the associated names let's give you a good comparison between geology and geophysics the geologists usually you will find them always going to the field uh, most of the courses in our department in geology they involve a great component of field visits some of the courses even they are not field based courses but still they go two days or three days do full day field work unfortunately nowadays because of this pandemic uh, you are studying from uh, home remotely and field uh, visits is uh, not possible this is very big burden on you as a geologist geologists they cannot understand the geology the, geophys the geology itself sorry sorry go close this door because sorry. oh sorry someone was Can you confirm you can listen to me? Hello? Yes, yes I can. Oh, good. I hear you. Someone was like open, trying to open the door. So geologists, they care a lot about maps and rocks, outcoops and lenses. These are very important to uh, volcanic sites, get samples, do testings these things usually not very important they are important for geophysics too but not that much important geologist geophysics sorry you'll find most of the time they are working in their laptops okay. i lost the subtitles just let me switch it off in case there is so stay we are in sq this connection is slow me try to make connection a bit better anyway so the geologist you the geophysics usually they will work with the electronics I'm seeing some questions I think no 
If you have any question, please raise your voice. That will be better for me. If you have any concern or question, please just raise your voice. Talk to the talk to all the classes. Don't be shy. We don't see you. We don't know who you are. So <laughs> take uh, get some courage and talk to all of us. So geophysicists usually they work with equations. They take a lot of courses in math and they work with electronics, computers, because uh, as I said, we do a lot of recording of things. Again, someone is knocking the door. I will, I will not open it. So they work with electronics because those electronics or equipment, they record those signals they send to the earth. It's uh, a seismic signal, for example, I'm sending seismic waves, uh, uh, resistivity, and sorry, I will open the door because he kept knocking a lot. Sorry about that. We are back again. So the geophysicists, they care a lot about electronics. We, in our department, we have a lot of equipments, like geology, uh, seismic equipments, graffiti and magnetic. Those are equipments with which either can send some signal or just receive a natural occurring phenomenon, like graffiti. Graffiti is a natural occurring phenomenon. It has gravitational force. We just record that force. But there is a point we need to integrate the world together. Integration is very important. And uh, without integration, the final output is never ever complete. So you need to integrate the work perfectly. Have you heard of LIDAR data or GS, GIS data? Those are new techniques uh, which can be used for geologists and geophysicists too. There are models, uh, the reservoir models. You heard of probably the in petroleum companies they make a model. Either this is a static model made of uh, the layering of the air, the porosity, the permeability. Uh, it cannot be done alone by geophysicists. They need to know the geological information too. Without that. The, the, the end product is never ever the final product or complete product and this in this point or this line we need to make some integration I probably gave you once an example of a person who tried to join an oil company and in the meeting during the meeting meeting they asked him a question the question was very simple they asked him would you like to work as a team or work alone you know what was his um, answer? He said, no, I prefer to work alone because I'm expert. He was a SKU graduate and he was like a very smart guy. His grade was above 3.6, but he made a mistake. He said, no, I would like to work alone. I'm an independent guy. No, they, 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 they said, no, we can't uh, let you join our company because your attitude is different. In hey, in all companies usually prefer to work as teams integrate the work and learn from each other. No one can do a thing. There was a question from Lanuda. How is it right now? Is it, uh, the, how is the connection right now? Doctor, uh, your voice uh, are uh, very clear, but uh, the bar point is, are not. The PowerPoint are not clear? Yes, exactly. The PowerPoint resolution. Yeah, the PowerPoint resolution. And I think it's not because of Google Meeting. I think because you are opening two streams. Yes. Uh, um, right now, the connection is through SKU connection, not Wi-Fi. So it's supposed to be the best connection possible. That's one reason. Uh, for example, uh, I know she's saying that it's not working and the, the result is too bad. 
both photo and sound. The sound is not clear too. Shall I shut down the YouTube connection? I don't recommend that. Victor? Yes. Victor? Do you no, have the slides at least? The link of the YouTube. Sorry? Okay. No one, I think, in the stream. We can't right after Here is the stream, sorry. That's the stream link. Only here. You can watch me through there if you want. Uh, Dictor. Yes. Go ahead. هنا في عندك خيار في الجوجل جوجل ميت تحت بريزنت ناو بامكانك تضغط عليه ويظهر كل ويندو اللي انت فاتح انه عندك يعني يظهر عندنا الباوربوينت بشكل واضح وصورتك بشكل واضح في نفس الوقت How is it right now Just wait. شوف تو دكتور الباوربوينت واضح وانت موجود عند شاشة فوق. Okay, is that better? Yes, a lot better. Yeah. It's better. A lot better. Victor. Yes. Can I log out from this meet and go to screen? Sorry? What you wonder? I can't listen to you. Yeah? The one here who is talking right now, I can't listen to him. There is a guy who's saying uh, the link I sent right now is good. I think, huh? talking right now Omar close your mic Omar yes yes just said someone who was talking close your mic because uh, this there is an echo I am hearing how is it right now is it clear yeah yeah it's clear doctor uh, and the, the screen is it's clear for the streaming is it uh, you can watch me from the stream if you like. I sent you the link, the streaming link. Yes. I, sent, I sent it again. Doctor. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can I close this link and go to Google Stream because it's not clear here? I can't hear clear. you. I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Your mic is so bad, I couldn't hear you. There was a problem with your mic, so I couldn't hear you. Let me continue. I think the students are saying it's clear right now. Am I right? Doctor. Yes. Doctor. Yes. Uh, I think his question, can we leave, can we leave uh, the Google Meet and just uh, see you from the YouTube? Because uh, he work, I think, in the same device. Okay. No problem. We have, we have to leave from this and just see you on the YouTube streaming. No problem at all. If the screen here, but okay. the problem is that you probably have a question. In YouTube, I cannot keep watching on the chat all the time. You got my point? Okay, so... In uh, case you have a question, device, you might uh, ask me then. And I can't, if you are not watching me in here, then I, can't, I cannot answer your questions. That, that's the point of Google Meet. Um, there is another actually, point. Actually, he is my friend, so if he, if he had an, an, any question, he can tell me by WhatsApp and I will tell you. That's a problem, Doctor. I will bring two replies. Um, 
from next next time onward I will not stream I just record the video is that clear and I upload it later yes so I will not students are saying that the resolution is good right now on YouTube it's much better I know I know it's uh, for some reason it's not clear in here because in YouTube uh, I'm streaming the full resolution in uh, Google Meet the maximum resolu the resolution you can reach is 720 in, uh, in YouTube it's uh, just wait for a second Ah, so here people are saying again it's good in me. Sorry about that. This is the cleaner. He keep making noises outside in front of my door. So let's continue. Let's continue. I got. I lost my mood in here. This is. There is this comic in. Uh, I found it interesting. Uh, there is a lecturer or a teacher asking three people. One of them is a geologist. The other two are uh, engineers and geophysicists. The question is, what is two plus two? So the answer given by the engineer is very exact. It's four, but the geo geologist is giving a range. And finally, the geophysicist is asking what you would like it to be. So here, you might say, okay, the petroleum engineer is giving the right answer, the correct answer. He's the smartest guy, and uh, the geophysicist probably is the most stupid guy. Uh, it's not that simple because in geology itself, things are not exact. Things are not accurate. Even oil companies, whenever they say we found some oil somewhere, the reported number is not simply one number. It's a range of numbers. They say, okay, I, we found some hydrocarbon, oil or gas somewhere, but with these uncertainties, it, it can be, that's the base number, but it can be as low as that, that much, or as high as another number. So uncertainty is an inherent thing in geology. You cannot know the thing very certain, certainly. There is also always some ambiguity related to geology. And uh, you need to appreciate these things. Because uh, everything in geology, there, there are some guesses you make. And uh, you need to incorporate these guesses into your numbers, into your uh, results, into your records, into your reports. So um, we cannot say, for that reason, we cannot say that geophysicist is the most stupid guy. But yes, uh, whenever we are dealing with mathematical equations, with physical phenomena, probably, we are supposed to be a bit certain about our results. That's not the case in geology. Geology is a subjective science. The thing I see, probably, you might not agree with me on that. At least I, I bring a lot of proof to the to the point, to my uh, end results. Then I decrease the uncertainty. So we talk about how we improve the uncertainty. In geophysics, one of the methods to improve the uncertainty is to integrate or bring or use different techniques. Uh, uh, in this case, you are using your testing and your uh, hearing and your eyesight. You are using more than one sense to understand more about the same, the same subject or the same rock type you are dealing with. Um, this is one of the techniques probably you can use to decrease the uncertainty you find. Another thing which is very important as well 
is to incorporate your in the results and discuss them with geologists. You probably made a model or uh, came up with some uh, idea uh, using geophysical data. Does those results or uh, the, your findings, do they make any sense? The geologist can tell you. Is it possible, like structurally, to make a fault the one you suggested? Is the fault, is it possible to make like a fault very parallel fault? Who knows? The geologists, the best people who know are the geologists. And the, the, within, among the geologists, the best people are the structural geologists. So why don't I ask him? I ask him, okay, my geophysical interpretation is this. Do they agree with your understanding of structure or geology in general? If he says yes, then you can give some more certainty to your results. You can say, okay, my results are more certain right now. I'm decreasing the ambiguity. That's how you, uh, you work with geophysical data. You cannot say my geophysical data are like 100% accurate because geology is very complex earth or complex structure or complex material. The rock itself, um, usually it's hard to know what is the percentage of each mineral within the same rock because they, they do like, um, I'm not sure what exactly the testing they do, but they are uh, X-ray diffractions or whatever. Uh, type of experiments they do on the rock to, and, uh, to know what are the different type of compositions or mineral uh, the rock is made up. But uh, it's almost very hard to exactly determine the percentage of these minerals within the rock, the same rock sample, whether it's big or small. And imagine if you're talking about the whole earth, it's then more complex, it's more troublesome to understand uh, um, every feature or every aspect very accurately. So don't laugh on this comic. It's just a, a comic or cartoon. But yeah, there is, that's the reason why we say there are ranges or there is uncertainty in, uh, in geophysical and geological data. Because in geophysical data, you are not seeing the rock. You are uh, not drilling. You made your guesses based on something on some physical observations you made. Whether they are right or wrong, it depends how accurate you were, how accurate your assumption is, and how you correlated them with other results you have, either ge geological or other geophysical techniques. What, how, you probably ask, what, how I can combine those geophysical techniques? Um, I might give you an, uh, an answer, for example, let's say uh, density and seismic. You should use gravity technique, you understand what is the density of the, these rock, the rocks, also bring their velocity. So you do not depend on the density of these rocks, but their velocity too. And even the magnetic properties of these rocks, you can do magnetic survey then, magnetization, magnetization of these rocks, and you keep bringing or lowering down the uncertainty. And I hope that this is clear, but the key point in here is always try to integrate geology with geophysics or geophysics with the geology. Uh, what are the certain type of data I can bring to, ge uh, to ge geophysists? What are, for example, different type of data I can bring to geophysist to make, uh, to decrease the uncertainty he has. Can I, can I get an answer from someone? Uh, yes, uh, maybe the, the location of fault or seismic points. Good, that's really good. But uh, for oil exploration, for, for example, in oil exploration, uh, you can lower down the uncertainty from cuttings. When you are drilling, you see the cuttings coming to the surface. Am I right? So the cuttings, when you examine them, mm -hmm. when you examine those cuttings, you will right away understand what is the rock type. So this is how you can decrease your uncertainty with the, geoph with the geophysical data. 
Angel yes, physics? Uh, as you mentioned in the, the oil industry, um, th there is actually a combination of efforts. Uh, for example, uh, the geologists lower uh, the logs and they can read something uh, yes. to make sure of it. As you said, we can we can take the cuttings. At the same time, the petroleum engineer or the the, the mud engineer can uh, as well uh, analyze the the fluids in the mud tank and can exactly tell the the fluid type, and that can help even in determining some some properties, physical properties of the rock. Absolutely. So this is an integration work. It's a work uh, done by several people from different disciplines uh, with the same objective to understand the rock properties or the subsurface properties. In the, in the perspective of uh, petroleum engineering, that's the reservoir properties. So going back to our slides, uh, geophysical techniques, there are usually two different techniques, two broad techniques. One of them is active methods. The other one is path, passive methods. How I can differentiate between these two techniques? Uh, the first one, I can say I'm, I'm sending something to the earth. I'm exciting the earth. I'm sending an energy to the earth. For example, the seismic method, in the seismic method, I'm sending sound waves to the earth and listening to the, to the echoes back at the surface using some other equipment or recording uh, equipment. So the idea here, I'm listening to something. I, I'm sending something and listening back to the response. In the passive techniques, usually uh, we call them also um, the natural phenomena happening on the earth. Those natural phenomena are either gravity or magnetic. So gravity is a passive, magnetic also a passive technique. There are other techniques, but we'll not go study them in this course. For example, SP technique, spontaneous potential, is also a passive technique. But for that technique, uh, we'll probably, probably will not cover it in this uh, course. We'll go a bit in detail about gravity and magnetic techniques. So that's the main difference between these two techniques. One of them is, uh, with the, are we sending something to the earth, some energy or not? In terms of scale, there is usually two scales or variant variation in scale. Things can be really very small or they can be large in size. I will not go in detail because I covered that one, I believe last, last lecture, this slide. I will upload that course too to the YouTube. So in these two scales, for example, one of you already talked about that. He said uh, 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 wheel logs. Those are wheel logs. In wheel logs, actually, we send some instrument down the wheel and keep recording uh, the physical property of the of the earth, whether it's uh, its density or its uh, sonic. Sonic is the velocity. I spoke actually of the velocity we keep recording them, or resistivity even. And uh, the recording is done every half feet. The recording is done every half feet. So the scale is very small. The resolution is very high. In comparison to the, to the second image we see, we are, for example, in this case, we are studying whole the Arabian Peninsula. We can't be very, very, uh, I mean, take measurement every half a feet to study all of this uh, area. So the scale is totally different. Resolution is another topic. Resolution actually is defined by many parameters. One of the very important parameters, how is the spatial distance between various stations or recording you make? In case of graffiti, for example, I need to take readings every every like one kilometer or two kilometer. If you decrease that spacing, you will increase the spatial res uh, the spatial resolution or uh, horizontal resolution in this case. So this is uh, how we define the resolutions. So in seismic resolution is defined by the range of frequencies. We talk about what are the frequencies, but I believe you already know what is wave frequency. Wave has a frequency. So uh, consecutive peaks or trough, how close they are, they define the frequency of the wave. But if I send uh, 
a range of frequency my bandwidth is higher so my resolution increases if I am dealing with geophysical uh, sorry seismic uh, method and the resolution is usually a bit worse with uh, graffiti and magnetic techniques we'll, uh, we'll cover that later on but let's do like spatial and uh, vertical resolution spatial is horizontal resolution and vertical is um, the vertical resolution you will see that graffiti magnetics they usually comes at the lower end at the beginning of the of this graph they are really low in resolution and the highest resolution these are the core data microscopy what is microscopy is the microscope the minerals you study in, and the microscope the, resolu the resolution there is very very high uh, the core data the fmi images will not cover them but uh, VSP also, VSP is seismic method, vertical seismic profiles, they name them. The resolution is a bit better than other techniques. Outgroup, in terms of spatial resolution, they are, mm, yeah, you can say they are not good because the outgroup, you are not, you are seeing the vertical resolution. You cannot, maybe in one dimension, you see the horizontal or horizontal resolution but not in depth so the outgroup they have good resolution at least the vertical resolution is very very good but they are not as good as the thing you study under microscope the highest possible resolution is under the microscope so this is the resolution we usually deal with so we need to appreciate how the resolution is some people they say the resolution is how I can separate between two features, two geophysical uh, geological features using geophysical techniques. If you have two layers, can I differentiate these two layers? There is a slide about that soon. So geophysical techniques is measuring uh, geophysical quantities with respect to time or position. So what is time? How I, I relate time to physical quantities? One might ask. Yes, uh, the earth physical quantities, they might change at the same position if you make the recording at different times. So the recording you make at the night probably is different. It gives you a different recording than the same, uh, the same position you make a recording later on during the daytime so there is a component of time as well not just the position uh, one might ask give us good example how that changes uh, let let uh, let me say for example there is irrigation system you are irrigating something or there is a leakage of pipe a pipe leakage and the company asked you as a geophysical contractor or expert geophysicist to tell me exactly where is the leakage and how much it expanded. You make a reading today at the same location and after two days you come back or three days you come back make the same reading. Geophysical techniques can tell you how much how much the leakage spread down the ground. Today was that that much area was uh, affected by the leakage after two days, because they keep uh, leaking, there is some uh, whatever material was leaking from the pipes and spread in a huge, bigger area. So here the component of time is involved. This position is certainly there is variation. Geology from one location to another location is not always the same. So I'm uh, responding to uh, the change in physical property of the earth with respect to position and time. Any geophysical data you record, they are associated with noise. And your task as a geophysicist is to separate the signal. The signal in this respect is the thing you want. And who tells what is signal, what is uh, the noise, what is what part you want and what part you don't want is the objective of your study. Uh, we'll come back to that later on, but in general, in geophysical data, there is also a component, always a component of noise associated with your data.
to understand the signal you need to remove the noise and there are many different techniques filtering other techniques we'll come back to them later on this is just an introduction and a general overview of geophysics mm, I give you an example uh, let's say that you are sending sound waves to the ground and one, you want the same time to listen to them once, once they are reflected back they hit the ground the layers different layers whenever there is a change in velocity there is a reflection so the, the ray goes down to the earth hits are uh, a boundary between two layers and there is a variation in in velocity or even in density there is a reflection back but assume that there are traffic or other people playing uh, football nearby they will make noises so you uh, you try to remove the noise and get get the signal the signal is the thing you are sending to the ground so this is very important and understanding the noise in geophysical techniques is very important but i let you say uh, let you know something uh, removing the noise if it's not done the acquisition when you acquire the data if it's not done properly in the field it's better to waste or dump those data than process them what i mean by that i mean when you are recording the data and you are doing seismic acquisition you will find some truck moving around big lorry or truck moving nearby it's better to stop recording it's better not to hit the ground and uh, don't send the energy until ex except until the car passes away or the truck passes away then you start recording because that truck keeps sending noises to the ground some signal you don't want to record because uh, you are you don't have the control over that thing you have control on whatever you are sending you, you have control you can control you know the location where exactly you hit you hit the ground you send by hammer for example so hammer is your the source in this case is the source you use to send seismic energy and listen them back when they are returning back to the surface so if the acquisition is not done properly there is not much use you cannot do a lot of filtering to the data you cannot improve the signal to noise ratio in that case so the best your best friend in such cases is to do uh, the acquisitions they vibrate this they vibrate or shake the earth when you're shaking the earth, they you send seismic waves to the ground. Vib uh, vibrators are not the only way uh, to make uh, seismic surveys. Vibrator only works on ma on land, on shore. They will not work on marine. There are different type of sources. This is the geophysical source right now. This is the source which sends energy down the ground. It's a vibrator. In land, it's used quite often because it's kind of uh, not destructive technique it will not destroy your ground uh, whereas dynamite have you heard of dynamite an explosive uh, method yes, yes probably yeah dynamite also can be used but uh, it's not recommended nowadays because in uh, vibrators are better controllable sources you can you have full control on the vi vibrator but you don't have the control the correct control or full control on the dynamite once you done you make the explosion you it's hard to repeat it again but for for the, the vibrators if you miss something of or you do something wrong it's easy to to do the recording again without any uh, destruction to the ground uh, and uh, those two, two uh, techniques, either using dynamite or vibrators, they are applicable to the land data. In the marine, we use different techniques. So this is data acquisition. This is what you see, these are data acquisitions. 
and these are my sources. We talk about a little bit about the acquisition system or the recording systems or the recording equipments. So here is a good setup. It's a full setup usually, but it's very simplified um, using some cartoon um, diagram. So what I'm seeing is, is a recording system. That's the recording system. Everything is da uh, tied to this and I'm lying down some equipment or sensors. They are very sensitive sensors. They can listen to the slightest vibrations. And I have a geology. In this case, I'm having different layers. And there is a fault. So what happens when I shake the ground using a vibrator? So this is the truck itself is called vibrator. But the thing which make the shaking is viprocise. The word viprocise is this plate, is this system, is not the truck itself. Any truck can carry this vipro, vi, vi, viprocise. So the truck, we name it vibrator because it, uh, it uh, carry along with it uh, an equipment called viprocise. Viprocise usually sends uh, or shake the ground in certain manner. How exactly we'll learn later on. So this is our source and those are our setup or the recording system. Uh, the energy usually is sent down as waves and they move deeper and deeper with time. At later time they go deeper. But whenever there is a change in the property of the earth, in this case the change is the velocity or the density, they get reflected back they get reflected back and I can listen to them. I can record the reflections. And the time it takes for them to, from the, this point when they were sent, to be recorded back by the instrument sensors, that's very important time. Then the time, that time can tell me, okay, uh, the record, uh, how deep these layers are how deep these layers are. The geophysicist finally is supposed to come with an image of the subsurface, an image of the subsurface resembles or quite similar to the geological image. So what you will see, they are geophysical data. So for like seismic, there are some amplitudes. You will see later on what are the amplitudes. But you make the, those data very similar to the, or as much, close to the uh, geological data. They are supposed to resemble the geological data. This is another acquisition system, but in here it's not a seismic, it's a different acquisition system. I'm using graffiti technique. So the lines you see, those lines, is those, these are called profiles. So this is one profile, another, I'm having how many profiles? Are you around? She's not Ibrahim. Oh, when they listen, I'm talking. They, Layla. Hmm, they keep leaving. Majid. Yes. Okay, Majid. Good to hear you. How many profiles do you think are there? I think three. Yes, there are simply three profiles. So those are profiles. And you move along profiles. So uh, how, how you decided the profiles, how many profiles I make, that was in the planning stage or setup stage. You make these things, decide on these things before you go to the field. Before you go to the field, you're supposed to know how many points should I take, how many readings I take, and how many profiles I should make. So these are the profiles. And uh, those dots, they are called stations or recording points. So those are the stations. There is another name for the profile, they call it also traverse. This is one traverse, another traverse, and those are stations. So one profile, one of these profiles, if I keep recording, it, it gives me a reading. And when I plot it in a cross plot like that, I get something called anomaly. What is anomaly? We'll discuss what is the anomaly. 
but in this case that change you see there is a change in the reading that what is responsible about that change is is this target target is the thing I'm interested in the thing I want to know about where it where it's located what's its shape uh, how, how big is it the size of it that the thing usually I'm interested on is called the target and the, th the other things, the rock surrounding that, they are called host rock. So what is the host rock? Is the overboarding. The other rock surrounding the target, those are called host rock. What is, what is the target? How you can define the target and how you can define the host rock is based on your interest. Probably you are interested on this dike. Another person is not interested on the dike, is interested on the other rock, the host rock, or the rock which was cut by the dike. So for that guy, probably that's the target. This is the host. So the target, what is the target and what is the host rock is defined based on your objective, what you are looking for. Are you interested on that dike or you are interested on the, on the surrounding rocks? That's then how I can differentiate on the target and on the host rock. Um, yeah, I will come back to that later on. The data acquisition, do you remember when I said, uh, that when I talked about resolution? In here, the data acquisition stage defines your resolution to how you want the resolution to be. Small resolution, very resi high resolution, they can be defined at the stage of data acquisition. You cannot increase the resolution at later stages when you are doing processing or modeling, no. Resolution cannot be improved. You are doing just then cosmetic or makeup to improve the image of your uh, seismic results. But if you miss something during the acquisition phase, the best, then best thing is to improve your results optimally is go back again do the same acquisition with different setup or with more points. And sometimes the points are not taken along traverses or along profiles. They might be taken up along a grid. A grid, this is a grid. What is usually a grid? A grid is a, those are, there are some points spread on surface of something, but with a certain defined X and Y spacing. So here I'm having certain spacing in the in the vertical direction and in the in the horizontal direction. That spacing might be for X and Y might be same, might be different. So this is a grid of points. How I can increase the resolution? Ha al hakim al hakim al hakam. Yes, Doctor. How I can increase the resolution in this case? By uh, decreasing the distance between the Perfect. between the grids? Yes, not between the grid, between the points. Between the, the yeah, between the points. In the grid, or make the grid yeah. more dense. When I yeah. say the grid is more dense, means the spacing x or y or both of them is decreased. You have more more data. Yeah. You will have more data. Another was uh, another way of uh, representing your data. Usually, the data you take is make contour. Geologists they like contours, like making contours. Uh, probably you have already studied uh, uh, contouring, how to make contourings. But nowadays, most of the usually the contouring is done by computer software. You will not do it by hand. You don't spend hours doing uh, hand contouring. Uh, that was just an exercise in geology one to understand what's contouring and how it can be done. But uh, in, ge in geophysics itself, we usually use computer and or programming softwares like MATLAB, Python, other programming softwares to create for us nice looking contours. Those contours can be just wow, black and white, the one like the one you see in here with the contour lines annotated. So there is an annotation along the contour line. Those annotations tell you something. Okay, that contour, at that contour, what was the density? 
or what was the velocity or other physical property of the earth and you can use even um, coloring so the high contours get a different color low contour values get um, also a different presentation No, 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 good. Okay. Someone was saying that he lost the connection prompts or something. Okay, sorry about that then. So this is how you do data acquisition, is um, make dense data. Making dense data, then you can get a higher resolution image of the subsurface. Then once you finish data acquisition, the thing uh, you record... I have a question, Doctor. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, yeah. No, at all. Uh, in the data acquisition, um, if, if maybe a 2D contour map, I okay. Lost, I lost you. Um, can you repeat they told again? Me to sorry, sorry. Can you repeat again? I yes, uh, for sure. Can you, can you go... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Can you go back uh, one slide? Here? Yeah. For example, uh, they give me the yeah the the picture in the middle and in, in the left. Okay. This one. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, this one. And they told me, for example, to uh, to calculate the the area of it. Now it is a picture. How can I do that? If it's still uh, calculate what exactly? Calculate what? maybe the area of 2,500. Of a certain Sheet. contour, you mean? Yes, of a certain contour. Oh, it's very simple. Is there a software? You said that there is a software to be used? The, you can use softwares. You can, it's better to use actually softwares. You know, it's doing it by hand. It's not uh, yeah, do you, very good. Can you recommend? Mm, um, I can recommend. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you go my recommendation, I ask you to use Python or <laughs> MATLAB program. You might not go. I there is no uh, certain yeah. uh, program or software ready-made software in my mind right now. But I believe um, I forgot the names. I'm very familiar with Petrel. Have you heard of Petrel? It's uh, yes. no. Petrel can do that for you. But there are other simpler, simpler methods. If uh, if if it was me, I might use a programming. I program it myself and bring the make the contour myself using a program. Gotcha. Then, then calculate you. the volume or the area surrounding a certain um, surrounding a certain like a contour. So his question was basically: Can I tell what is the area con surrounded by this contour? And is there any software can do that for me? Yes, there are. There are a lot of softwares. So the contouring and the mapping and the understanding the volume of rock or volume of the area. This is not elevation. So if it's elevation, you might tell what is the volume of the rock. But those are, in this case, in geophys they are geophysical properties. The physics for the velocity or the density of the rocks, they are not directly related to the elevation. Any other questions so far apart from what he asked? Uh, yes, Kefko. yes, uh, about the land acquisition, they they generate the waves by the white process, yes, but uh, regarding to the marine ones, how they generate the, uh, okay. the waves uh, that's a really good question so in marine they use something called air gun it's very common uh, they use something called air gun air gun You see this one? Yes. So this is the air gun. What is air gun? It's uh, a vacuum. It's an, equip an equipment type of a seismic source. Uh, they send a high pressure wave there 
into some vacuum and the pressure is released very suddenly. That's how it works. So they cannot vibrate the, the, the sea. They send a pressure wave. There is a, 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 a chamber inside this equipment, a chamber or a small volume. They fill it with, the, uh, with the whatever gas or air. And the pressure there is so high, they, pre they release it suddenly. And that the release of that sudden energy makes an explosion, sea explosion, or a boom. And uh, the energy is released, uh, seismic waves. They keep traveling. Um, you might ask how it travels. It is the same wave. There is uh, some caveats then. I mean, there are certain types of seismic waves. There are many seismic We'll learn that later on. Some of the seismic waves, they can't travel in sea. Uh, I mean, this is something to keep in mind. They can't travel in sea, some seismic waves. Anyway, that was uh, his question. Any more questions? No, so uh, doctor. Want... Yes. Doctor, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, the wave reflection depends on what? Uh, um, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> the wave reflection, how it reflects or refracts the two points. When it's reflected, it hits this boundary, reflects back. Or it refracts, it, go, it goes inside. And it uh, passes from this layer to the other layer. That's a refraction, probably. They call it refraction. It depends on exactly the acoustic impedance, something called acoustic impedance. Acoustic P tense. Sorry, I'm not using an actual pen. Impedance. Acoust acoustic impedance simply V times P. V is the velocity, P is what? Density. So if the density and velocity between these two layers is different, there is some, there is some reflection. And some, uh, some part of the energy passes through this boundary. But if this the VP between these two layers is exactly the same, there is no reflection. Is that clear? Uh, yes, it's clear. Yeah, we'll go back to that thing late again. Uh, we'll go back to that thing. Yes. Such this, uh, this picture. I, I cannot so hear you at all. Perfect. I will send you all the questions. Uh, better write it here. Make it short. Any other questions so far? No more questions from anyone else? Thank you, Dr. No. Okay. Uh, one thing I would like to make a note on, uh, call me my, by my name, always. I prefer to be called by my name, like Khalil, rather than saying doctor. <laughs> so I probably will go a little bit on this data reduction. What is data reduction? Uh, the data you recorded or you made during the acquisition phase or the survey phase, usually it's not truly representative of geophysical data. How is that? There is a variation which comes to your data based on other parameters. Let me see his question. Oh, it reflects from full. 
Oh, from forward. Okay. How it reflects from forward? It does not reflect from forward. It diffracts. If there is a forward, let me make a drawing in here. If there is a fault, that's the fault, yes. Oh, I forgot that. It's already written in here. It does not reflect from fault. It diffracts. There is a diffraction. The energy goes to every direction. The energy goes to all directions from these points. So what you will be recording then, no, you will get, you will know that there is a fault. You will know that there is a fault, uh, but but you cannot uh, right away determine those diffraction are created by fault or something else. In case of seismic, as you said, I mean size, you said on the seismic, you cannot directly tell then that that uh, that diffraction is caused by a fault or not. It might be caused by something else will not go to details, but data processing can help. Data processing, that's the stage we do data processing. Then data processing can tell is that the diffraction I'm seeing is from fault or not. So faults, uh, this is uh, diffraction. And you see it's called primary reflection this is a primary reflection this is a primary reflection this is also primary there are a lot of primary there is another word called multiple reflection multiple reflection is a noise why is that because the energy wind the energy you see this line you see this line We'll come back to this, some of this, sorry, this line. It went here, hit a boundary, reflected back, and again, without going to the surface, without being recorded, it reflected again down, and reflected back. So it went down and reflected back. That's a multiple, this is a noise. In seismic, multiple is usually considered as noise. So you try to remove that thing. You try to understand how I can remove multiples. And how we remove multiples, I think it's not uh, the scope of this course. The students who are taking seismic data processing, there is a course called seismic data processing, uh, they will deal with that such phenomenon. They understand how to remove multiples. And how to remove, for example, this layer. This is an unwithered layer. Uh, those noises. You see this wave? This is a wave. This is either love wave, this is the love wave, and this is the Riley wave. They are noises too. They are not reflections. I'm, I'm interested in reflections. So those are noises too. That's what I said, how to remove noise. So noise. They, they correct the noise? They remove it. They don't correct it. So remove the removing the noise can be done in several ways. One of the ways is how I make my field acquisition setup. Another way is filtering or processing. Processing and signal to noise for removal. So doctor, the best reading comes from primary reflection? In seismic, yes. The be, not the best, that's, that's my signal, that's what I'm interested on. I want to remove everything else except the primaries. The diffraction, oh, the diffraction is not noise usually also, if it comes from uh, a fault. But I need to correct it. There is a process called migration, which corrects the diffractions. And, uh, that's how then I tell whether this is a fault or not. I'm left with five minutes. I will not put not five minutes, ten minutes. I usually want to spare the last ten minutes for questions, but since you are asking a lot of questions, 
and this is a good chance to learn a lot about geophysics and I'm very happy for today's uh, lecture because you asked a lot. They hope we keep the same way always. I, I'm happy to... Uh, how they filter the noise? Yes, this is also a good question. How they filter the noise? Um, Nada is asking, Nada al -Ghafri. She's saying how we can filter the noise. Okay, let me give you a simple example. Uh, let's go to this seismic example. This is because I talked about uh, a lot. So let's say my, my, my signal is something like that. And this is my signal. And this is S. Let's say this is S. There is another, another signal another wave which is that but what I receive usually I receive both of them I'm collecting everything my recording system is recording all of them it's combination of these two where is my mouse plus so I see two things I see something like general So, sorry, let's assume that this is, um, yeah, let me make, make it simple for you. Oh, sorry. This is my noise, this is my signal. In this case, which one you think have higher frequency? Nada. Can you tell me which one has the higher frequency? You can type V. Where is V? This is uh, noise. And yes, N. Noise has higher frequency. How I can tell? Because the consecutive peak or trough, they are closer to each other. This is a trough, trough, peak, peak. This is the lambda. Or wavelength it has shorter wavelength it's have longer wavelength the frequency in here is lower the frequency in here is higher how I can remove these things that's very simple then okay I already know the frequencies I do some filtering which can there are some type of filtering not in geophysics by the way only in signal processing in uh, ele electrical analysis, elect uh, people in the electrical engineering, they do that a lot. People in image processing, they do a lot. People in the medic, the med medicine, they use this type of filtering too. And many of techniques we use in geophysics actually were developed by people in other disciplines, in image processing, in, um, in computer science, or sorry, in uh, electrical engineering especially the filtering techniques. So I do something called, you don't need to know it, but I know do something called uh, Fourier analysis, Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis tells me, oh, there are two frequencies, two frequencies. One is this high frequency, one is this low frequency. And in, in this stage, you know, once you are in the, f in the frequency domain, just remove this one. That's how simple is it. Uh, we we'll learn later on that primaries are higher reflection than Riley and love waves. So you see, this is this two wave type. You will learn that those Riley and love waves they are higher frequencies than primary. So, sorry, lower frequencies than the primary. That's a, another technique. This is a simple technique to remove. Uh, you have chance for two more questions. We are left with five minutes. Let's get some quick questions. Thank you, Nada. That was a good question. I'm happy to answer any questions you have so on what we have covered so far. But uh, let's see data reduction. Yeah, we can cover these things. Okay, I want to keep rotation. Okay. Any for more for the questions? Guys. 
Thank you, Khalid. You're very welcome. So, if you don't have a questions, I might ask some question because uh, we still have some time. Let me go to to here to this thing, this question. How I can increase the resolution with seismic? How I can increase the resolution of seismic data? Um, reducing the distances of the geophones. Yeah, that's one point. Or, yeah, Ola said decreasing the Reduce distance the between geophones or or decreasing the distance between what? Between the uh, the vibrator and the receiver. Yes. So vibrators, they don't make usually they don't make one a uh, one pod, uh, one, one shot. Or one, uh, they don't vibrate one location. They keep moving, so they move every like 25, 50, or 100, and they keep recording. So you might decrease that uh, distance, but keep in mind that there is a budget constraint. The higher the resolution, the more exponential, the more money you spend. And another thing send more waves send more like frequencies another thing is to send more frequencies uh, for example those vibrators they keep shaking they shake the ground they start with the low frequency the plate moves slowly then the plate keep moving very at high acceleration so it move it generates a wave or something like let me draw it something the vibrator the energy sent by the vibrator it's called the sweep vibrator sweep it's an energy like that mm, it's not very clear okay? so let me show something in here vibrator sweep That's vibro size sweep. Okay, it's opening all the dock. Mm, yeah, here is it. You see the frequency, it increases with time. So the frequency is low in here, higher, keep higher. So you see the distances, the amplitude length, sorry, the lambda length, the wavelength is decreasing. The amplitude is increasing. So it starts from 1 hertz up to 5 hertz. They call it by precise sweep. So when you send more frequencies, it means you are recording more things. You try to record more things. But uh, that's not the scope of this course. That's why just a general question and answer because we were having a time. And the time is uh, finished right now. We need to end the recording and the stream. And we'll meet day after tomorrow. I'm happy to see all of you almost attended today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Keep safe. Have a nice day. Study hard. Keep everything um, up to date. Don't delay your studies. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Oh, another thing. I keep receiving message asking uh, like um, asking uh, would you make uh, the material available on module I think the material are available already in uh, in Google uh, and Google uh, classroom and I can download them easily so please yes please just use Google classroom it's simple it's easy it's uh, for me it, uh, I can keep those data forever if I use module after two years, probably, or three years maximum, I lose all my uh, archived courses. 
So I prefer to keep uh, using uh, Google Classroom. And it's easily integrated with G Suite system we have right now implemented in SKU. Uh, whenever I make like uh, an assignment, you will get reminders always in your email addresses. Is that clear? So let's keep using that thing. So I will end right now. We'll meet after two after one day.